Real people, real celebrities, real talk. Join the Breakfast Club. Weekday morning, 6 to 10. Morning, everybody. It's DJ NV Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest, an author in the building with us this morning. That's right. My man, MK Asante. MK Asante. Now, I read this guy's book about two, three weeks ago, and it's funny because I had the book sitting up here for the longest. For a long time, right? It's called Buck, mm-hmm. but I, I, I don't know what made me decide to read it a couple weeks ago, and I really enjoyed it. So I'm like, yo, we got to have this guy up here to talk about. His his book Buck. Well, explain to us yeah. what Buck is. I didn't get a chance to read it. I, I don't I don't really have much time read. to read. <laughs> I, you know, I got four kids. As you can tell by the way he writes, he he, he talks. He doesn't. <laughs> oh, and he's talking about me over there. Yeah. <laughs> now, now tell us about Buck. All right. Well, first of all, it's really an honor to be here. I watch you guys all the time. Thank so you. you know, what I'm saying much love. Um, D riding, bro. Like, <laughs> what else the kids say? Yo, hey, you giving him props? You D riding? Hey, you saw Charlemagne D riding his book. Now he D riding Charlemagne. Well, yo, you you read the book and you you were thirsty, so you yeah, know what I mean. Thirsty. I had to come on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know when you show interest, that's that means thirsty these days. Yeah. But you know, um, I'm just happy to be here. But you know, Buck is about the graceful survival against impossible circumstances. You so know, it's what I'm like saying? what? I'm from Philly. You know what I mean? Young Buck, Buck Wild, Buck Shots, Buck Town, Slave Buck, Black Buck, Make Buck, Buck Now. Buck encompasses all of those things. I chose the title because it, it really, my life, it's a coming of age memoir. It's my story, it's my mm-hmm. journey, growing up through Philly, navigating my education, my very informal education, miseducation, re-education, self-education, street education, the difference in the distance between school and education. Mm-hmm. That was all me. And so it's it's about that journey, it's about my family, it's about my community, it's about how I became, you know, I was someone who got kicked out of every school I went to. Wow. And then he was ended, a bad seed. He was a thug. <laughs> and then ended up being the youngest tenured professor in the country. Mm-hmm. You know How what I mean? How old are you? Um, I'm 32 now. But you look 19. <laughs> but when I became a professor, I was 20. I was 23, and I got tenure when I was 26. You know what I mean? So I've been at academia for a while, and um, so it's about my journey. Well, How- tell us about the, this journey a little bit. So you're from Philadelphia. You, uh, as Charlemagne would say, you, you got kicked out of every school. So you were a young thug. You know what I mean? (laughs) Shout shout out shout out to all the kids that you know, are being overlooked right now. Shout out to all the kids that are, are labeled bad because they're really well. You a lot of t- bad if you were selling dope. No, I, was, I wasn't selling dope. Okay, but I but there are there are there is some some drug selling that goes on in the book. And, what did you and do in my so life. bad as a child? Um, in my life, you know, I think uh, I was just rebel. I was rebellious. Mm-hmm. I was rebelling against everything. You wow. know what I mean? Um, I think first of all, the school system, right? It, it's it's redundant. It's boring. You know, rote memorization, regurgitation. I wasn't actually learning anything in school. Plus, my family situation situation was kind of crazy. My brother, he was locked up. My mom, I write about mental health issues. My mom uh, was institutionalized. She had severe depression, suicidal. So my mom was in and out the institutions. You know what I'm saying? And so your mom and father split. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? So all of these things kind of created a perfect storm. Plus, we had the corner boys on my block. You know what I'm saying? They were always out there and they introduced me to everything. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? So by the time I was 14, it was on, you right. know what I mean? Like everything you could imagine, everything you don't want your child to, your four kids, everything you don't want them to do, you were doing. I was doing, you right. know what I'm saying? So, um, well, and now, now, now your brother, your brother's locked up. It's two questions I want to ask you about them. Yeah. Is your brother out now? Yeah, still? my brother is is definitely out. What's up, Uzi? Uwap, Big Uzi too. That's that's my hero. First of all, he has to change his name from Uzi. <laughs> Uwap, Uzi is not it. How many names, how many years did he do? Like. He, I he mean, he, he was, you know, he was uh, in and out, in and out, you know what I'm saying? Um, but when he was in Arizona, which is for, for most of the book, he was, the book takes place between the ages of 13 to 18. Gotcha. Um, and so he was like locked up for most of that time when I was, when I was coming well, up. He shot somebody. No, no. He in was, the book, he, that's what he was in jail for in Arizona? No, no. Remember, Did you uh, read the book? Yeah. <laughs> he shot somebody. No, nah, he didn't shoot anybody. You know what I'm saying? He, he was just, beat him up or something. <laughs> no, nah, he didn't beat anybody up, but he did beat other people up. That he just didn't get read? locked oh, up I'm talking about, Slow down. What was he locked up for in Arizona? <laughs> in Arizona, it was a situation um, with a young girl, and he was young himself. Oh, he was, was 17. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got you, got you. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Um, but he was young himself. He was 17. The girl was like 14. He didn't know. She was white. He's black, obviously, and her. She was a runaway. Her parents found out, and it was just you know. Right, got you. Was, he got he got put in the system. So what what got you straight? I, you know, from being on the corner with the D boys and and being so rebellious. What got you to fix up? I mean, there was a couple factors, man. I saw first of all, I saw what that life, where that life takes you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whether it was my brother, whether it was my one of my best friends, Amir, who got murdered while I was there. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of things kind of shaped me. But also the blank page, man. That's what this book really is about. It's about finding your purpose. 
That blank page saved me. America enraged me. Then that trick paid me. New slaves, old slavery. Grandma told me streets far from holy. Now I'm lonely. My homies' bodies is holy. So basically, the blank page saved me. That blank piece of paper in front of me. The first mm -hmm. time I got a creative writing assignment. The first time I was able to express myself. Things started flowing and I gripped the pen and something shot down my spine and sat me straight up. You know, the, the mm -hmm. pen was heavy like it was made of stone. And that first class, man, that first time I was able to express myself, it changed my life because then I, from writing, I started reading. I wanted to be a good writer, so I had to be a good reader. And when I started reading, I had an epiphany. Like, oh, now I realize why I reading was illegal for slaves back in the day because I realized that we think in words, we sub-vocalize. Right. So the more words we know, the more things we can think about. And so for me, reading became connected to my liberation. And you it, helps you, it helps you transcend your circumstances too because they always say anything you want to hide from a black person, put it in a book. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The information yeah. is there. We just gotta, we, we just gotta, we just gotta uh, give ourselves access to it. Now you said something earlier about the curriculum of, of most schools, you know, and yeah. you said it, it's boring and, and kids don't get it. And I, I agree with that. And, and I'm a big definitely with my kids where I want to show them life. Like I yeah. like to take them out. I like to, to teach to teach them what a mortgage is and, and how to yeah. invest money because I think with that they learn more and it's more interesting real because it's education. real life. And I hated school. I, I didn't get it. I, I, I didn't understand it. I wasn't into it. So, you know, during school I always dreamed of what I wanted to do, whether it was music, whether it was yeah. play ball or whatever it was. Now, you also said you're a professor. Yes. Now, explain to us how you teach. What makes you different than all of the things you said you disliked? Okay, that's what's up. Well, I'm a professor at Morgan State University, which is in Baltimore, Maryland. Let me right? tell you one thing about Morgan State. I'm going to tell you why I didn't go. Okay. <laughs> when, I went for the, um, when I went to Morgan State to check it out, to, to, to go on a tour, they yeah. were playing dice. <laughs> it was too black for that baby. No, boy. no, that's they were playing said. dice on the actual dorm steps. And my dad was like, you're not going to go here. This is like Queens. And I wound up going to Hampton. It was between Morgan and Hampton. And I wound up going to yeah, Hampton. Yeah, he went where Pusha T was selling bricks of coke. <laughs> as opposed to guys playing dice on campus. Pusha T selling weight out to school. So that, but you, went with, you didn't want to go be around the dice. You want to be around the cocaine. <laughs> Sorry, Pusha. Your you statute of limitations is up. <laughs> Well you, know, <laughs> well, well, you know, Morgan is, is, is right in the heart of Baltimore, you know right. what I mean? That's one of the reasons why I love it and one of the reasons why I teach there, you know what I mean? Because of it's right in the community, you know? But as a professor, man, you know, I bring that experiential learning that you were talking about, mm -hmm. you know, we bring real things into class. So I teach creative writing, I teach film, and my whole thing is, you know, I found my voice, I found my purpose, and mm -hmm. I'm a writer. This is my fourth book, actually, you know what I mean? So really? Yeah, this is my fourth. So, right. you know, what, what, and this is the, it's the only one that's on the bestseller list, you know what I mean? So this is kind of my most recognized Book. Gotcha. But, you know, I've been writing for a while, so my whole thing is helping other people find their voice, you know what I mean? So I work with students all the time to help them cultivate their own voices mm -hmm. so that they can express themselves, you know, in the way that it did for me. Because this stuff saved my life, man. Reading, writing, um, we just need more of that. Yeah, you know what I mean. And and what we and you know what we did. What was so crazy about this project is I didn't want to stop at just the book. You know, I got the Sundance uh, Film Fellowship to write the movie, so I'm working on the movie. But then what we did was we decided to do something completely different, which was to create a soundtrack for the book. So we created an original soundtrack with original music. That's why he keep busting out in the rhymes. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 <laughs> but how do we get more of us to be professors? Because nowadays being a professor, being a teacher is not cool. You know what I mean? It's a rapper, it's a it's a, a DJ, it's a basketball player. Yeah. We don't really, I don't really see young African-American professors. And if I do, they're usually teaching gym. Yeah, <laughs> gym. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that, that's true. A, no, it's not. You're it right. Is. I mean, you're right. I don't right. really see that many. You're right. I, you I've been I went to a couple of high schools to, t to speak, and a lot of the African-American teachers were doing gym or, or what do they call it physical education yeah a lot of the spanish teachers i'm serious a lot of spanish teachers were doing guess what well i mean what i mean rappers spanish. and djs have a have a dope mark <laughs> it's, <spanish. laughs> it's the truth <laughs> it's the truth you know i went to school and, you know but miss whatever what do you speak what do you teach spanish you know yeah, miss yeah. rodriguez miss, miss garcia, <laughs> <What do you laughs> miss garcia? <laughs> um but, but you know like the thing is um i think rappers and djs have dope marketing plans right and i think in a lot of ways for mm. academia for professors I am part of the new marketing plan. Right. I am the new model. I think that a lot of times, and that's why I, I travel, I've been over 40 countries. I travel all around this country and I, I, I want young people to see me. That's why I wrote a memoir, not a novel, not something made up, a memoir. I why want them to see me. 
Well, I got a soundtrack to Professor it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> the, oh, yeah, the only professor passing out the mixtape yeah. at the last day of class. That's actually one of my class. I teach a hip-hop class where we look at the social political issues that affect hip-hop, that hip-hop was birthed from. We look at the evolution of it. We look at the culture of it. We really study it, you know, um, analytically. But, you know, one of the things I try to do, man, is to let them see me so they can see what a professor could look like. Right. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be some you know, um, some archaic thing that they have in their mind. It could be something new. It could be something fresh. Your professor could be a rapper. You know what I mean? Word. Your professor gotcha. could be a rapper and could be a writer and so, could be a filmmaker. And, could, you know, we, we I think we live in a world now where we're out we're out of these boxes, man. Like, you, you have to be multidimensional in, in, this, in this currency, in this environment. And so I think part of it, how do we get more? You guys having me on. You know Absolutely. what I'm saying? That's, that's, part, that's part of it. You know what I'm saying? Because they see like, wow, like there's so many people, young people that I've come in contact with who I've changed their whole model, their whole blueprint. Because they're like, oh, wow, you could do that. And you could do, I didn't even know I could do that and, and have access to these things and have the resources and take care of my family and be able to do all these, you know, so it's really like showing them. That's the thing. I think our whole generation is about visuals, right? Yeah. Instagram. So we have to show, mm -hmm. right? When you show, it, it, it makes it's, it gotcha. resonates and I think right now you know people will probably say well he don't look like a professor well, the question you should be asking is what does a professor look like exactly but, but you know what but that's what most people think now I was thinking to myself when he said he was a professor I was like damn does he wear that t-shirt and hat in class well, why not yeah. I, I think it would be dope buddy. definitely but, but this is you? exactly how I dress that's in class dope. you can ask all my students I come in fitted snapbacks Tim's whatever because that's that's who I am you right. know what I'm saying and just you know when you become whatever profession you are it doesn't mean you take away who you are and your core essence because at the end of the day that rebellious 13, 14, 15, 16 year old that's still me right. you know what I mean and so what I've done in a lot of ways is and that's what Buck really is about that whole notion of Buck now I've become a lot smarter you know I used to be I think a rebel without a cause and now I'm a rebel with a purpose and a cause you know what I mean so the rebellion is still there you know I was in Baltimore I was out there with him you know what I'm saying like that's part of my so spirit you live you in Baltimore now right yeah I live in Baltimore and I live in Chapel Hill North Carolina what did you see out there as you were down there for the Baltimore riots because you, you, you burnt know, down some you blew up some cars <laughs> and the reason I say that is you know me and Charlemagne Charlemagne <laughs> believes he, he he doesn't agree but he said he understands with what yeah, a lot I of believe the in cause and effect. I believe you can't and, keep pushing somebody and expect somebody not to push back. And so I, I may not agree with the riots, but understand why they're happening. And I feel yeah. like a lot of times when we when we get those riots, we hurt ourselves in, in the long yeah. run. We hurt our own community. We hurt the stores and, and the places that we shop at that we you know own or purchase or or have to do with. And I think we we kind of hurt ourselves at the end of the day. You know, we, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, I, I hate to see us get arrested and get felonies on our record and then when we try to get a job we can't because of a, a mistake or something that we did yeah. foolishness or that we shouldn't have done but the problem is they can't get jobs right now anyway Word regardless up. of that see mm -hmm. what we saw in baltimore was like we saw the crazy what happens when you underfund the school system mm -hmm. right when you invest in the prison industrial complex, right? When your schools are criminal, when you don't invest in neighborhoods, we saw all these things coming out. And so we got destitute poverty in Baltimore, right? We got underdevelopment. We got, like I said, an educational system that takes money, million, hundreds of millions of dollars out of the school system every year, and they put that money into prison industrial complex, right? And so we see now the illustration of what happens when you do that to a community, when a community is constantly beat and beat and beat and oppressed and oppressed and oppressed press we see what happens and so i'm actually surprised that it doesn't happen more often you know but every it, city in america has the potential to do that no, you're right Absolutely. Like right but, but now we tore up our communities but it's not like, our communities but, let's but, be for real we don't really, it's really own not ours. The, we don't I, own I, none I, of that but it's stuff. where we shop it's where we, we we do business we drive to the next town over you know what we're not going to be welcome to the next time over and a lot of people can't drive in we're the not next welcome time over. there now but it seems like the things that they care about was they cared about them baltimore orioles and that game they, they they made sure that stadium was safe oh yeah and you, you really got a chance to see the classism in baltimore and in america with with the i don't even call them riots i call them rebellions and i feel like these I call rebellions peaceful protests i feel like these rebellions have been happening since 1619 mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. black folks basically got here in america there's been if you look at the history it's cyclical every 10, 15 years, you see these huge, what they call riots, what I call rebellions in the urban cities in America, and they always are related to race. And this is historically, you can go back to the 18th century, 19th century, you see these same things happening, whether it's Miami or Philly or Cleveland or Detroit right. or LA or Watts or you know Baltimore. It's always the same thing, Newark, right? And so, um, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's a continuation of that, you know what I mean? And you saw the classism because 
if you went to the harbor, you saw a whole different story. Right. Like they had, that's when you saw the big guns. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm, the, mm-hmm. the tanks and all of that. And, you know, you, 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 you know, Whole Foods, nah. You, n- n- none of that happened in their whole. They were foods. protecting all that. They were protecting all of that. You know what I mean. And so it, you know they value. We we realize in the society that property is more valued valued than, than the black people, person's life. than the black person's life because right. they're talking about violence in Baltimore with the protesters. But actually, the the only violence really that we saw was, was violence Gray. against Freddie Gray. And that's my thing. He broke the, his neck. The media can make it seem like it's so bad to riot. How about make it make it seem like it's so bad for police to kill? To He's kill. An armed black man. I just kill people, period. All the time. And we just saw in Wisconsin, he just, you know, no charges. Right. Right? Robinson. Yep. Tony, Tony Robinson. Tony Robinson. Yep. 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 Tony now, Robinson. Now, uh, just a quick little segue. Um, the girl Nia in the book. Yeah. Are you still smashing that? <laughs> you, still... you just kind of let that go in the book. It's like you was in love <laughs> you with her. Pervert, you just, man. I just want to know. I'm like, so what happened? Did they get married? Yeah, like... you know, I mean, I, I got to say, you know, like, any any brother out there that's doing this thing, shout out to to the queen that's holding him down, or you know, because that that's so important for me. When I was young, this book is a coming of age, so mm-hmm. this is between the ages of thirteen and eighteen. When I was young, there was a girl named Nia, um, and she really held me down. She mm-hmm. actually helped deter me away from some of the negativity. Gotcha. She asked questions. She she questioned me. You know what I mean in ways that I hadn't really been questioned. Mm-hmm. You know what are you doing? Like she she really she showed me a different side, and I always appreciate that. Uh, about her, um, we're not together. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that was a long time so ago. So you got your life together and didn't go back to get her. <laughs> just, just I, like found, a I found somebody else. You know oh. what I mean? <laughs> Later on in life, she found somebody else too. She's good. We're both good. You know what I mean? We're still. I stole my friend. She's a psychologist, um, and she's uh, for the Navy, and she's doing her thing. So, How's your mom doing? Because in, in the book, you talk about your mom's mental health issues. Yeah, what I do in the book is I intersperse my mom's journal. I used to read my mom's diary back in mm. the day. Uh, we didn't talk a lot. She's still alive? Yeah, my mom's still alive. Mm. And so I used to read her journal, and in the book, I actually put her actual journal entries in the book. So Did you your mom get... clear this? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Okay, okay. In fact, my mom, it was her idea because she struggled so bad with uh, severe uh, mental health issues. She felt like the black community, we don't talk about depression and stuff enough. Mm. You know what I mean? So she I said... Agree. Because she talks about depression, suicide, all of this stuff in her journal entries. And she said, you know, when I was writing my book, she was like, you should use it because even though it's personal and I don't want, like, I don't want the world to know all my problems, mm-hmm. she said it might be helpful in starting a dialogue and creating a conversation. Because a lot of times we just like, oh, it's all good, it's all good. But it's really not all good and we self-medicate. But we don't really, un- like, when I first started understanding about what mental health issues are, like all the different, mental- I realized that every single person I grew up with has a mental health issue. Absolutely. Everybody on the block. Yes. Needs you help. Know, when you p- just pull out a gun and start shooting, something is clearly wrong. Something with you. is clear. And we, you know, we might be like, yo, Scoop crazy, man. Yo, Scoop be wildin'. But Scoop is really, really, really crazy. Like, crazy. Yeah, yeah, like he really. We gotta start using the clinical terms. So people understand <laughs> Scoop's really bipolar. <laughs> Scoop really is psychopathic, you know? <laughs> Scoop's really a sociopath. <laughs> That's what you start doing. Yeah, so my mom is doing a lot better now. Um, I realized that a lot of the things that me me and my brother were doing, just, you know, we were wilding out, it kind of affected her. You know, depression is, is, is chemical imbalance, so it's not just what somebody does, but we were exacerbating the problem by some of the things we were doing, you know what I mean? So um, my mom's doing a lot better now, you know. Um, Do you think your father left her because of the mental health issues, or did they really just grow apart? Um, man, I think like he doesn't really understand mental health. You know, mm-hmm. I think some people in our community, we still don't really, we like just snap out of it. You know what I'm right. saying? But we don't really. Boy, stop acting crazy. Yeah, yeah, stop acting yeah. crazy. But we don't really understand. So I don't think he understands like the gravity of the situation. You know what I mean? What's your relationship like with him now? Um, you know, it's it's always been turbulent my whole life. So right now, you know what I mean? It's it's pretty much, we don't really have a. It's not really. Popping. <laughs> He's got to be proud of you, though, because, I mean, in a lot of ways, when I see you now yeah. and read about how he was in the book, you are him. Yeah. To me. Yeah, well, no, I mean. Very pro-black, very conscious, you know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, and that's that's a lot to do with my mom, too. Like, my mom, I mean, both my parents, They, I was born in Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. Like, my parents, you know how at the end of Belly, Nas is like, yo, we should move to Africa. Mm-hmm. My parents actually did that. My parents are from America. Right. They way before Belly decided to move to Africa, they changed their names. So I was born in Zimbabwe, in Harare, Zimbabwe, you know what I mean, um, during the revolution, you know what I mean? And so then they eventually moved back and then I grew up in Philly. You know, Philly is like from age three on, I was in Philly. Um, but so they, they, they both instilled that in me. So I always had that, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, you know, I think with, with me and him, I think the thing about life is 
you never can really judge a man until he's in the grave. You really don't know how things are going to happen. I didn't know I was going to be here. And I used to see my book mm -hmm. right in the back over here. You know what I'm saying? I was like, yeah, I got to go on there one day, man. But you never really know what's going to happen in right. life. So with that situation, I just try to do it day by day. You know what I mean? And, you know, I think we're both, with all of our parents, we try to be better than they were. You know what I mean? And you, you see their weaknesses, you see their strengths, and you try to be better. And so that's what I'm trying to do, really. And, and what is Talib Kweli doing, doing with this soundtrack? Talib Kweli is doing everything, man. This dude, he's a big part of the, the, the book, just in the sense of when my transformation started to happen as a writer, as a mm -hmm. thinker, as a person, I started, that was around the time when Black Star was coming out mm -hmm. and Raucous and, you know, I was hearing lines like, at exactly which point do you start to realize that life without knowledge is death in disguise or lines like, these cats drink champagne and toast death in pain like slaves on a ship talking about who got the flyest chain. And that, like, I never heard someone rap like that, you know what right. I mean? I was always in the pock and, and, and Nas, but he, he took it to another level for me and so... Um, the first song I ever did as a as a rap artist, as a hip hop artist, was called Gods in the Hood. Razkaz reached out to me, Talib Kweli was on the track, and that was my first song. Um, and we we killed that joint, you know what I'm saying? And so from there, me and Kweli developed a relationship. Um, and when I told him I wanted to do the soundtrack and sent him some of the music I've been working on, because I've been working on music, because um, really to me. Like I want to, I want to use all mediums. You know what mm -hmm. I mean. So to me, all of these things are languages. Like writing a book, that's a language. Making a movie, that's a language. A poem is a language. All these different things. Music is a lang Music is probably the most universal language. Mm -hmm. So when I told him, I sent him the music. Um, actually, he was he's selling the book. This book on his on his website, KwaliClub.com. He called me one day. He was like, Yo, how much is the book? Da -da -da -da. We started talking about the book. I'm like, Actually, I got music. I sent him the music, and he was like, Yo. Like, I gotta get on this, like, whatever. So his company, Javoti Media, is actually officially presenting the soundtrack. Um, he's been involved, like, I mean, every day, just, you know, building, strategic. We were just in Baltimore. We went to a whole bunch of places in Baltimore. He was in the community, Reflection Eternal Barbershop, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So he's just been a big part of, like, helping me, like, shepherding me into hip hop, um, gotcha. into the musical side of it. I wrote a book called It's Bigger Than Hip Hop which is um, you know, used in hundreds of colleges and universities about, about hip hop and you know, kind of like examining the social political aspects gotcha. of it. But yeah, he's just been like, he's been a big brother really in this whole situation. Well, we appreciate you joining us, man. Yeah, Yo, man. I appreciate y'all, man. This is this is amazing, man. Is it hard not to, to smash any of the chicks that you teach? And, never mind, don't worry about that. You know, it's it's not hard, oh, man. You know what I'm saying? Guy, it's this, this discipline, he's man. He's young. He's young. You discipline, know what man. You know what? You don't, don't even add this guy here. Where can they get Buck, man? They can get Buck at mkasante.com, at qualiclub.com, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's, a, it's a best, been on the bestseller list for two years now. Um, it's uh, available everywhere, anywhere books are sold, man. You know, they can get right. the soundtrack, KwaliClub.com, MKAsante.com. It's streaming on DJ Booth. Um, it's that OK Player. It's just, it's just everywhere, man. Right. But And it's free. It's Dupree Miller. And it's, and it's free. And shout out to Dupree Miller, Jan, Jan Miller, Nina. Nina. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I live it for them. Yeah. <laughs> my people, too. All right, that's MK Asante. <laughs> it's The Breakfast Club. Good morning.